Well, thank you all for joining us for our first public service perspective session um, of the semester. Um, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Mackenzie Kaharski. I am the Special Projects Coordinator here at the Hawaiian Ridge School. Um, before I turn it over to our speaker today, I do just have a couple quick items to cover. Um, we do ask that you keep your microphone muted to avoid any disruptions throughout the presentations, um, but you are welcome to leave your camera on. We would love to see all of your faces. I know it's the lunch hour, so please feel free to enjoy your lunch. Um, Although we do ask you to stay muted throughout, please um, utilize the chat as you wish. You can drop questions throughout the presentation and we'll address those at the end. Um, we also welcome you to ask your questions aloud. You can just use the raise your hand feature and we'll call on you to ask your question. And the last thing to note is the session is going to be recorded and we will make this available to watch on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Um, before we go ahead and get started, if anyone has any announcements or upcoming events to share, I um, welcome you to go ahead and do that at this time. Uh, terrific, McKenzie. I'd like to just flag that uh, Alex Deegan, the co-founder of Conservation X Labs and former chief scientist at U.S. Agency for National Development, is going to deliver the Kennedy Lecture on March 1st at 7.30 in the Baker Center Ballroom. Uh, he's a, a really interesting person who talks about his overseas conservation work, but now also public-private partnerships for developing disruptive technologies to tackle biodiversity loss. And so I urge folks on this call to check out that talk on March 1st at 7.30. Thanks, Jeff. Any other announcements to share, folks? OK, well, Jeff, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you. Um, folks, Dr. DeVelka will be introducing our speaker today. Thank you so much, Mackenzie. It's a great pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Barry Rabe, who is uh, joining us from the University of Michigan, where he is the J. Ira and Nikki Harris Family Professor of Public Policy at the Ford School. Uh, he also has, I think, at least four or five other appointments to different departments and programs at Michigan, which gives you a sense of how his um, work is relevant and cross-cutting and connects to lots of different disciplines. And he's a popular guy because he does some really interesting work. Um, Barry has made um, uh, really big contributions on understanding uh, a variety of kind of institutional and policy and politics questions around particularly uh, climate change. Uh, his book, Can We Price Carbon from MIT Press, really important book. He's working a lot um, with uh, the Brookings Institution, which as we know is a, um, is a leading Washington think tank that uses research to inform policy and uh, has done that. We're also uh, quite pleased to be using um, one of the kind of classic textbooks, Environmental Policy, New Directions for the 21st Century, where Barry is a co-editor. We're using that in multiple classes in our environmental studies program and our new master's in sustainable, sustainability, security, and resilience. So it's great that um, students from uh, both those programs can be uh, tuning in today, as well as colleagues from across campus. And so Barry, I turn it over to you. Really looking forward to this, uh, hearing about this new work that you're doing on, on methane and other short-lived uh, climate pollutants. Jeff, thank you. Um, it's really great to have a chance to, to work with you again. It's been all, far too many years. Thank you for that kind introduction. And a particular shout out to Mackenzie, who uh, plays such a huge role in organizing this and has just been phenomenally clear since our very first conversation. So my thanks to both of you. Um, you know, as you're suggesting, Jeff, I've worked a lot in the climate space in recent decades, principally on the issues of carbon dioxide, with good reasons, given the extraordinary role that CO2 from multiple sectors, multiple areas plays in contributing to the climate crisis. That's included, as you know, work on the political feasibility of carbon pricing but also a range of other policy tools and questions that generally have focused on carbon. I've decided in the last couple of years and for today um, to switch things up a little bit and focus on what I'm calling the other gases, underscoring that when we talk about climate change, carbon's role is staggeringly important, but it's not the only thing. And what I'll be presenting is some uh, work that is not in print yet, but I'm actually finalizing work on a paper that will be published in a series that we're producing in a collaboration between the Ford School 
our partners at the University of Toronto and the National Autonomous University of Mexico asking how in a number of areas, whether or not it is feasible or possible politically to develop uh, climate mitigation strategies that cut across national boundaries and take more of a continental perspective. My focus then today as reflected in today's presentation is on thinking about this in the case of short lived climate pollutants with a particular emphasis on the question of CH4 methane, perhaps the most consequential of the non carbon dioxide pollutants. Mackenzie's also graciously had some had some slide issues. You're going to switch and if, if you'll start the process, Mackenzie, we can we can roll on here. So without going too deep into the technical details, I want to begin by underscoring that carbon dioxide is best thought of as a long lived climate pollutant enters the atmosphere, stays in the atmosphere a long time and does its damage. But there's a subset of other climate contaminants, for our purposes, most notably methane, CH4, and hydrofluorocarbons, but also black carbon and tropospheric ozone that are a little different because they don't last nearly as long in the atmosphere, perhaps years or even just decades as opposed to multi-generations. But they have a global warming impact that is immediate and very, very intensive. So if you take a molecule or a ton of carbon dioxide and compare that with uh, a short-lived climate pollutant, it's the latter that has that most immediate kind of impact. A question from my standpoint, and this is an area where the social and policy sciences have not engaged as much. The most of the work, the scholarly work that's been done on short-lived pollutants has been done by colleagues in the natural and physical sciences is asking what does this mean in policy terms? Does the politics of our ability to try to mitigate climate change issues, challenges, change when we know the impacts are gonna be immediate and front-loaded? I think also bringing these short-lived climate pollutants into greater policy attention, certainly in the US, but also internationally in just the last few years, has as we begin to look at ways that uh, we might stave off some of the most near-term immediate impacts, taking a frontal assault on some of these pollutants could pay some really substantial dividends. It's estimated that about one quarter to one third of the global warming that has already occurred is, it attributable, is attributable to a collective impact of these short-lived climate pollutants and lots of calculations being done. If we were to hit certain emission reduction tar targets from this subset of, of pollutants, what we might be able to achieve by the middle of the century or the end of the century in terms of net benefits. How does that play out in political terms? How does that play out in policy terms? Next slide, please. So oh, I'd like to begin, and it's always nice to begin an environmental policy discussion on an upside. And that is the story of hydrofluorocarbons. This gets remarkably little attention. I was talking to a terrific national reporter on this very issue just yesterday and how little coverage there has been of the fact that both globally, but also the United States, we've really developed strategies to begin to move on HFC transition. It's a very, very interesting story. We could just spend all of our time just focusing on HFCs, but I wanna to turn to methane pretty quickly here. But HFCs were initially herald, heralded as environmental goods because they were alternative ways to maintain air conditioning and refrigeration systems when we began to realize that an earlier set of chemicals used widely in the US and around the world were depleting the ozone layer. HFCs came along in the late 80s, 1990s, and have really helped stabilize ozone layer depletion under the Montreal Protocol and subsequent amendments. But part of the challenge of HFCs going forward is that they remain very short-lived, you guessed it, climate pollutants with this very intensive impact. And as we begin to see refrigeration systems and the like uh, struggle with these questions, 
uh, a dramatic set of scientific advancements to begin to look at a post HFC generation of these kinds of, of coolant chemicals. Next slide, please. Even in the United States, where presidents and Congresses have struggled with the issue of climate change for decades. And we have a current president and Congress that wants to do more with climate and are still struggling. In an amazing set of developments in December of 2020, the last weeks of the Donald Trump presidency, a point of enormous contention and even questions about the survivability of our Republic, Congress added a 14 page amendment to a bill that was over a thousand pages and focused on pandemic stimulus known as the American Innovation and Manufacturing Leadership or AIM Act of 2020 with unusually broad bipartisan support, an equally large number of Republican and Democratic co-sponsors. This bill, 14 pages, laid out a mechanism to align the United States with global transition targets set up under an international agreement that the US had not been part of. How did this happen? Well, we began to see in this case, deep industry divides. A lot of manufacturers of HFC products that wanted to keep going, and yet new producers, new developers who were arguing we really have alternatives and the science is very strong in the US, we can do this. And there could be huge commercial advantage to it. And so you begin to see a real divide and split on the industry and even groups like the American Chamber of Commerce saying, we really need to pass this climate friendly legislation. We also had this very dynamic bottom up activity, which we see in some areas of climate policy. A uh, dramatic increase in the number of states, American states, that adopted some form of HFC transition policy of their own, particularly in the years 2019 and 2020. States retained power to do this and kind of pushed the edge of the federal government to the point where industry began to be concerned. Do we really want to have 50 different standards for how we deal with cooling and air conditioning chemicals and systems going forward. And finally, building on the Montreal Protocol, there was Kigali or the Kigali Amendments to the Montreal Protocol, which had been put together in 2015 and 2016, an international agreement, which for those nations on the outside of that agreement, like the US for some time, there was a possibility of having global markets for exports of these chemicals closed off in the coming years. That package came together in a very unique way, bipartisan support in the House, bipartisan support in the Senate. President Trump signed that entire bill, not clear that there's no evidence to suggest he was actively engaged in the formation of the policy. And within the last year, We've begun to see rules, provisions, and regulations go into place that don't fully resolve this issue. The United States Senate has still not ratified this treaty, and so there's some really interesting questions there. But if you're looking at sort of case studies or examples where even in the very divisive context of American politics on an issue like climate change, there's at least one short-lived climate pollutant where most nations of the world and now the US are marching largely together to try to really achieve deep, deep cuts and cuts, cuts in, in climate impacts and transition us for a much better future in this particular sector. Next slide, please. But with that, we turn to perhaps a, clearly a less successful and tougher story. What about methane, CH4? Emerges from multiple sectors perhaps most notably in countries like the US, the energy sector, fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal, but also other sectors like agriculture, livestock, solid waste management, wastewater treatment, a really interesting complex problem. For our purposes, I'll principally focus on my remaining marks, remarks on the oil and gas sector, which has the lion's share of energy sector emissions in the US, and particularly focus on venting and flaring. 
This is a photo from North Dakota, our third largest oil producing state. On the right, you see that flame that's flaring. When methane is released from below the surface of the earth into the atmosphere, and you put a torch there, in theory, that's being converted from methane, a very intensive short-lived gas into carbon dioxide. Possibly that pipe in the center, and this is an oil pump, not really focused on gas, they're just releasing this largely into the atmosphere. That could be methane venting. You're much less likely to see methane, except if it accumulates in unusual clouds, it's less visible or in some cases, invisible. In that case, that would be direct venting or release of methane into the atmosphere. And this is the issue. These are the issues in using gas or natural gas, both at the point of production, but then along that entire supply chain, transitions, shipment, pipelines, cargoes, liquefaction, however it gets from this point source into our homes, into our factories, into our, uh, into our gas burning power plants. This is what we mean by venting and flaring in the, in the, in the, in the, in the energy methane area. Next slide. Why should dealing with energy methane be relatively easy? There are a number of factors that make this interesting that at least in theory, one would anticipate that the US and the world are way ahead on methane, perhaps like HFCs in comparison to carbon. That methane that's being released, whether it's directly through venting or through a flared operation is the sheer waste of a natural resource that is non-renewable and it has commercial value. Carbon dioxide has a small amount of commercial value Methane, which is the core constituent element in natural gas, has a lot of value. So when you see that release occurring, whatever you think about climate issues or other considerations, that's wasting a natural resource. You're never going to get it back. And it's costing people and states and businesses money. I always like to point out that at drilling sites in many parts of the US, we produce carbon dioxide and methane, and in some cases, helium. Helium is very, very tightly regulated. And it's not just used for balloons. It's also used in medical procedures like MRIs and the like. It has enormous value. In that case, the US and most countries have a very, very strong record of measuring, monitoring, regulating, and taxing helium in ways we just have not been doing for methane. But the reasons to do this are, don't just end there. When you release methane into the atmosphere, certainly under that flaring process, you're also producing in all likelihood air quality contaminants, risks to public health beyond climate change, volatile organic compounds, benzene and others. Uh, it's certainly in cases of flaring where that's not working in a perfect way. And so we see in many areas where there's lots of methane being released, big time air quality and public health concerns. There's also the Norway model and actually the Norway and Saudi Arabia model. We have two major oil producing companies that understood the methane challenge early, invested heavily in the technology, have a regulatory and in the Norway case, a very tight tax, tax structure to the point where their methane losses to produce and use gas are much, much less than we see in the US or most other energy producers. And it's been true in Norway for over 30 years. There's a fundamental difference in the way Norway harvests oil and gas versus the US and most other places around the world. In the Middle East, Saudi Arabia has gotten on top of this issue as well. And then you have this sort of short-lived climate pollutant impact of methane. If you release a ton of methane into the atmosphere, it has 87 times the global warming power over the, an equivalent amount of carbon during its first two decades in the atmosphere. Want to take a dent out of global warming, near term or short term? Methane's quite potent. And finally, one often hears in discussions of Norway or reads in discussions of, of not Norway, excuse me, methane, the reference of low hanging fruit. I would argue that there is not a single area of climate emissions or certainly compared to carbon 
where there are as many technologies and techniques that can be used at low or no cost to capture that gas rather than waste it and develop it. And so if you put this entire package together, you might assume, and this is sort of my initial theory going into this area, that we were making similar progress in methane to HFCs, and yet we, for the most part, have not. Next slide. In part, that's because of politics and some really, really tough issues when we get to methane, nationally and globally. Most drilling in the US and around the world is done in relatively low income, rural or urban areas, including most hydraulic fracturing. In many cases, power over the, over the energy production is vested not in the federal government, but with states and local governments are basically preempted or precluded from playing any formal role in designing, determining whether oil and gas operations come into a particular community. Secondly, we see in a great many states, including Marcellus Shale region states like Pennsylvania, like West Virginia, and yes, Ohio, very strong energy production industry associations that are focused on a particular state or a regional shale play like the Marcellus Shale. And the tendency to have created within many petro states, very accommodating uh, regimes, regulatory commissions that are closely tied to the industry and often do everything possible to maximize production. It's often in their charge and not wanting to inconvenience industry. We still don't have good data on a point source by point source, state by state, region basis on these emissions. That leads to, you know, guess what? Downward measurement bias. There's a kind of self-reporting, self-assessment that has been hard to monitor, at least until we begin to bring in remote sensing and, and satellite and newer technologies that has led us to project numbers, not just in the US. And as we do deeper analysis of this, routinely they are low ball kinds of estimates. And so underestimation of the problem. There are also other issues. What happens when the wells stop producing? Idle and orphan wells. They may still release seep or belch methane, just like coal mines. The general tendency in most production states or nations around the world is not to inconvenience industry, not to put bonding, in, bonding provisions into play or tax provisions and allow them to walk away when the oil and gas stops to be produced. There's that kind of a sensitivity to accommodating industry's preferences. And finally, and this is very true in many parts of the US, and it's one of the reasons why I think that this issue has just exploded in places like Texas and New Mexico, the Permian Basin, or in the Bakken, the large oil producing regions in North Dakota from which you saw a picture a moment ago. In cases where you go in with fracking technology and try to get into a shale play and you're going aggressively after oil and the profit margins may be greater for oil than gas, you may not have any idea if gas is going to emerge and hence you may simply not want to invest in the capture technology, you might, may not be required to. And what we see in many production settings around the world is that what starts out rapidly with oil can quickly change to gas or so-called associated gas. Suddenly you have a site and a technology system that's designed for one fossil fuel that doesn't necessarily transition to another. And often states are very reluctant to bridge this transition. I've actually charted this out in some of my work. And this issue began to surface in Texas in the 1940s and 50s had nothing to do with environmental considerations, but coming from ranchers who were concerned that they were not getting benefits or royalty payments from gas that was being released, but there wasn't pressure then or to some extent now to force a change and prepare for the larger set of issues that you're going to face when you puncture the ground, trigger a fracking operation and go for that oil and subsequently that gas. So some of these issues kind of countermand these, 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 these um, what factors that might make it attractive and easy to go after methane. Next slide. So my point of departure in this paper is trying to make sense of this in a field where there's just not much academic literature on the politics of methane. 
My point of departure here is this photograph, which almost seems like ancient history, but is an agreement with three heads of North American heads of state more than five years ago. They call this the three amigos moment in Ottawa. All these folks should look younger than they do now, but um, they agreed among other things to set some very bold methane emission reduction targets by 2025, all taking a common agreement and pledge to work together. My question is, what's happened with this? Because there's been virtually no scholarly discussion of this particular pact and how it's played out. I wanted to know how these three nations have dealt with these issues. Next slide. Oh, this is just a measure of flaring. It is not a complete measure of methane, but I like this because uh, it involves World Bank data from satellites. It's not voluntary reporting. And you can begin to see some patterns and trends here, realizing how big the US, Mexico, and Canada have been, but moving in somewhat different directions, but a reminder that this is a global problem. And if those US numbers are high and they are, look at the Russian numbers and be mindful that the US produces more oil and gas in each of those years than Russia and move on. We have other kinds of challenges here, but these are the, these, these are the numbers. And so the continental contribution to this is big, but not exclusive. Next slide. One way to begin to think about how the nations have done is where by the end of 2020, this five-year time period where I was looking, and I've actually carried it now into, even into early 2022, where a nation ranks in terms of its actual emissions versus the oil and gas that's being produced. It's a tale of three stories. And with it, you can see the US record, the Canadian record where production has been high, but flaring has actually dropped. And then the Mexican case, where the rankings are higher in terms of total amount of flaring versus oil and gas production. Three very, very different stories, even though in 2015, they all agreed to move their nations in the same direction at the same pace. Next slide. Part of what I play with in the paper, I won't dwell on this here, is does a nation or a region's commitment to deal with methane link in part to how much oil and gas they actually have and can produce and benefit from as opposed to exporting. In the case of the European Union, which I won't dwell on too much in this paper, Europe now imports over 85% of its natural gas. It's dramatically reducing its production, countries like the Netherlands and Denmark, but it's importing more and more gas from Russia, from liquefied natural gas cargoes in the US. The US has just surpassed Russia for the first time in gas exports into Russia just in the last month of January of 2022. Each of these stories and cases is a little different. Are they importers? Are they exporters? And I want to sort of take a bit more time here and try to unpack the three predominant cases here, Mexico, Canada, and the US. Next slide. Mexico. Initially, it seemed out of that agreement, Mexico was poised to become a continental and global leader on methane. It passed in 2018 under a prior regime, legislation that was sort of state of the art. It was heralded by the environmental defense funds and a number of major uh, American and international environmental advocacy groups. And yet, oil and gas production, production have declined dramatically but their methane numbers are up substantially. It's staggering to think about what has happened in the Mexico context. Um, the methane emission numbers that we're seeing from the World Bank and that even Mexico is reporting through its Pemex, its nationalized oil company that is now the, has remained and is having an even larger role as the dominant oil and gas producer. It's really staggering if you compare even the rather high flaring numbers in the US to just across the border in Mexico. And ironically and sadly, Mexico has flaring so much natural gas that they have had to dramatically increase their imports of natural gas from, you guessed it, pipelines coming from Texas. 
So you have this huge inefficiency and challenges and problems in the, in the Mexican case going forward. And politically, there's just not been any will, political will to carry forward on that 2018 agreement. Next slide. Canada, by contrast, same commitments has moved in a different direction. Uh, still a very large oil and gas producer, all kinds of questions in terms of fossil fuels and the oil sands and all of the rest. But one has to note that the Canadians have honored their commitment. They quickly moved toward a regulatory process and backed it up, provided money and investment for technology investment, and in many respects have moved five or six years ahead of the United States and even farther than that in terms of Mexico in actually achieving some fairly substantial methane emissions and beginning to put in place the technology to measure more accurately. Uh, this despite the fact that Canada is a much smaller nation in terms of population, economy, and energy production than the US. This is one area, and Canada has struggled mightily in other areas of climate and environmental protection in recent years and decades. This is one area where Canada seemingly has delivered and moving from a kind of a global laggard position on methane into much more of a leadership role, including introduction of technologies, measures, and the like. But what about the United States? Next slide. What we have seen, and these are pictures of attorneys general, elected state attorneys general, all of whom, along with others from oil and gas producing states, aggressively went into court in 2015 and 2016 when the Obama administration tried to implement its 2015 agreement through reinterpretation of the Clean Air Act. Those regulations were tied into knots during the Trump presidency, responding to pressures from production states, primarily Republican dominated states reflecting the kind of partisan cleavage we see in so many states on all aspects of the climate issue. And so what we see in the U.S. record is one of continued expansion of oil and gas production during these years, quite substantial. And methane numbers that have fluctuated, have generally gone up and fluctuated. Some drops in 2020, as you saw in that table from some time ago, although some of that is linked to um, COVID and production declines and demand declines, that short blip where there was less energy use and the like. Um, so the U.S. has made some progress, but it's been quite uneven, and with so much power in the hands of production states. Next slide, please. We've seen states with generally very, very little appetite. Now, and Jeff, you and I have had this conversation before. A lot of my interest has been the ability of, in the U.S., American states to take the lead on climate change, as we've seen in some areas. But if you're looking at states in red, and I realize that includes Ohio, you're talking about one of the top 15 or so oil and gas producing states during this time period. The vast majority of these states have done nothing to change their methane policies during this time period. Many of them have used aggressive action by their attorneys general to block federal action. Uh, and so there's been a kind of inertia. Those policies that were in place in Texas in the 40s and 50s are, sad to say, largely about the same in the 2020s, similar in a number of other states. And yet, next si slide, please. I think one of the most interesting things we've seen in the last two or three years, and this is a big chunk of my paper, are a small subset of states that have begun to rethink the methane issue with a series of drivers. In Colorado, both of their most recent governors, John Hickenlooper, now a United States Senator, Jared Polis, have played a pretty active role in bringing in technologies, policies, measurements, and in many respects, Colorado's process of producing oil and gas vis-a-vis -vis methane is fundamentally different than much of the rest of the United States it begins to look a lot more like Canada, a lot more like Norway, a lot more frankly like Saudi Arabia through a series of steps. Partly here 
you had tremendous political resistance to drilling because it was being taking place not just in remote rural areas, but higher, more affluent areas and communities really began to push back aggressively. Also, that horrible scene in the lower right, you had a tragic fire from a subdivision in which one of those abandoned wells was never closed off properly. And a family turned on, um, I believe it was their gas stove and the house erupted. That then led to a multi-million dollar trust fund. And frankly, the state is using monies from that named in honor of the victims to try to fund technology transition. Next slide, please. As Mackenzie knows, I just got back from New Mexico. Um, weather just as cold as Ann Arbor and yet a climate to deal with methane unlike any place I've seen in the US except for Colorado. Since the election of Governor Luhan Grisham in 2018, she ran on a methane campaign. You don't hear many governors talking about this in 2018. She ran on this campaign within days of coming into office, issued an executive order. Uh, that's her environmental agency head and New Mexico and Colorado are racing to the top, trying to take the United States in a very, very different direction uh, on methane. Next slide, please. And so with it, you know, a year or two ago when I was starting to work on methane, I would get kinds of questions like, you know, why are you working on methane? No one studies methane. It's so obscure. Why are you doing this? And all of a sudden, it's sort of like Andy Warhol in 15 Minutes of Fame. Methane is like reached big time, uh, not because of me, but it's I'm sort of enjoying the ride. And I had no idea that in the run up to the most recent COP meetings in Glasgow, that the president of the United States was going to convene another one of his Zoom summits and talk expressly about methane. Now, this is a tricky one because the US does not have a particularly robust policy on this. And there hasn't been a huge amount of appetite in the 117th Congress to deal systematically with methane. I'm happy to talk about that and what may or may not come out of the current Congress, but issued a global methane challenge that has now has 110 signatories. And what this means if you're a signatory is you agree to participate and support an effort globally to reduce methane emissions from current levels by about a third by the end of this decade. The US is leading this effort, Canada is on board, Mexico is signed, even though they're going in completely the opposite direction on emissions. It's quite a coalition of nations, not as large as the number of nations that have ratified Kigali, but if we were having this conversation, my goodness, a year ago, there was no global regime. And now one is beginning to be in place with, with kind of Paris-like very loose arrangements and requirements. And so a terrific set of questions, at least from my standpoint, are, is this going to be another international agreement that you know, allows us to come together and kind of feel good about things and claim early credit, but we don't really do anything? Or is it going to be more like the Kigali HFC process whereby there is going to be a mechanism and really begin to move on these issues. Next slide, please. A question for me is, is methane beginning to resemble the HFCs? And, you know, I've rarely had this happen in my career. I wrote a first draft of this paper that's going to be published soon in July. And it was actually a pretty cynical paper. I am now with like days left on my deadline, like dramatically rewriting. I'm going like through track changes like crazy because the world has changed. I've never seen this kind of change in anything that I've been writing about. It has nothing to do with me prompting it. I'm just trying to react honestly to what I'm seeing. I think methane politics is changing in the United States, but elsewhere around the world. Um, we are seeing growing divides amongst any pro energy producers. In New Mexico, in Colorado, energy producers that want to continue to use gas but are arguing, we've already invested in the technology. We believe in the technology. We believe like the Norwegians, we can capture more than 99% of the gas. We don't have to waste it. Are we actually beginning to move into those jurisdictions to get ahead of and then perhaps be able to participate in export markets? There's some real divides between oil and gas producers. It's not just a, 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 a uniform opposition. We're also beginning to see kind of a 
a bottom-up effect. What really drove the Canadian process wasn't just the prime minister cutting a deal with the president of the United States and the president of Mexico, but he was getting some pressure from at least some of his provinces like British Columbia, which has a great carbon tax system, great in my estimation, but also some of the cleanest natural gas production in the world. In the US, the role that states like Colorado and New Mexico, and even a few other states like California and Pennsylvania are starting to play. To kind of push the federal agenda and challenge this is an interesting one to begin to look and examine. And finally, I think that an international agreement, even when it's kind of a soft agreement like the Global Methane Challenge, it's not blessed by the United Nations, it doesn't have formal treaty powers, at least not yet, but really pushes this question of how as energy moves across borders, those nations that are most concerned about climate aspects related to gas, which is a fossil fuel and causes issues, but those numbers just go crazy if you add the methane pieces to it. Um, do we begin to look at things like trade and border adjustments and import fees. The Europeans are talking about this, the whole notion of CBAM or carbon border adjustment mechanisms is to me the next wave of what we're likely to see this nexus between trade and environment and more and more firms are betting the future is in reducing their methane numbers for, for however long we use natural gas before we phase that out, how we begin to think about this. This is a slide that I couldn't have even thought about putting up as recently as eight months ago. I'm not saying the world is fundamentally shifted or changed, but at least it is interesting to weigh and think about this. One final slide, if you would, Mackenzie, and then let's open it up to questions. That said, the energy aspects of the methane issue are one thing, and there are other areas of methane that are probably quite easy containing methane losses from solid waste landfills or wastewater treatment systems. But even in the US where there's so much energy being produced, there's almost as much methane being produced from the livestock and agriculture sectors. And if you look at the role that dairy, beef and pork production play in the US, it's almost as large in methane numbers as it is in other areas. If there is a third rail, there are lots of third rails in climate politics, but if there is a third rail where there are very, very few instances and examples of serious methane reduction or mitigation in the US and internationally, this is one of them. And yet, if there are huge transitional opportunities underway in methane, if we obviously only focus on the energy sector, which we have to, in my estimation, if we ignore the agricultural or livestock aspects in the US and internationally, uh, we're only dealing with a small, small portion of this issue. So with that overview of short-lived climate pollutants, beginning with HFCs and working through now two sources of, of methane, I'm happy to turn things back, Mackenzie, to you and to Jeff and however you'd like to, to navigate conversation herein. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Barry. Um, really clear and and really in, in depth. While um, uh, really appreciate the kind of positive comparisons uh, to to start, and then how it's more challenging, but how that kind of gives us some indication that we can make progress in some um, ways forward. Um, so I would urge folks to um, ask questions in a couple of different ways. One is drop questions in the chat. Uh, the other is if you want to use the raise hand function and or turn on your camera and wave, <laughs> we can we can we can do it that way as well. Um, and so uh, have folks um, jump in with those. I'll maybe start out if I may, um, and say for the New Mexico and the Colorado case, Colorado, you had the example of the of the kind of tragedy and and policy change that comes out of a dramatic event. Um, New Mexico leadership obviously key, but are there are there dimensions of those two states that you think kind of um, uh, explain why they are are different outliers in terms of this going forward? So that we might look for those dynamics in other places, or try to generate those dynamics. 
Sure, it's a really great question. And you know, I think each case is a little different. And I would just only add in the New Mexico case, Jeff, there are a couple of really significant triggers. One is that there was actually a massive and visible plume of methane that gathered in the upper northwest corner of New Mexico, where there are four states, kind mm -hmm. of, it's called the Four Corners region, that was captured by NASA, became a huge concern around the state and underscored this issue, one. But secondly, because of the staggering amount of oil available through the Permian Basin, which is shared between Texas and New Mexico, New Mexico began to ascend dramatically to the point where now it is the second largest producer of oil in the United States after Texas. There was a period eight or 10 years ago where they really thought they were phasing down energy production. So both of those factors came to the play. And I would argue you had a couple of drivers there. One is just recognizing how big a challenge and an issue that this is uh, environmentally, but also the financial issues. If we waste all of that gas, um, about a third of the tax revenue for the state of New Mexico comes from a combination of oil and gas related taxes. And that's seen in New Mexico politics as like money out the door if you're just flaring or venting it into the atmosphere. So, you know, we often talk as sustainability discussions of sort of when the environment and good economics comes together. And I think they really did that in the, in the New Mexico case. Although that said, there's still years behind Colorado. They're still in early stages of putting all of this in place. And we don't know the longer term impacts of all of this. Terrific, terrific. That's um, that's helpful though to to see where again also New Mexico a big a big event got attention and got got priority. Um, let's turn uh, to Will Burns and then we'll go to Caitlin's question in the in the chat. But um, Will, we're thrilled to have you joining us with our MSSR program and teaching a course later this year. So why don't you jump in and ask a question? Thanks, Jeff, and thanks, Barry, for the presentation. It was great. Um, my question, and it's probably too early in days to know, but I was curious. So, you know, Biden signs an executive action plan in November on methane, right? And, you know, it includes right trying to reduce emissions from the from the oil and gas sector by like seventy five percent. Is is there any uh, early evidence of of uh, operationalizing that at this point? You know, it's a really great question, Will. I want to begin by saying, you know, it is really early, but so underscoring that. Um, I think that there's a little momentum here for a couple of reasons. One is that the Obama administration did put these series of regulations on new production in place that were, it was almost a regulatory not tied into them by the Trump administration to not only reverse them, but make it difficult to revisit those. In this case, early in the current Congress, early in 2021, Congress passed with predominantly but not exclusively Democratic votes to use the Congressional Review Act, which allows you to overturn regulatory decisions of a previous administration. This is one of these sort of wonky policy tools that doesn't get used very much. That had the ability to kind of jumpstart and restore the Obama era regulations immediately. And so what EPA is doing now, taking that charge from the president to go much, much farther, is using that as a foundation. So it actually has a congressional underpinning on it. It's not just, a, it's not just an executive order and trying to build on that. What we saw um, around the time of Kigali was EPA come forward with a kind of a next generation and a next series of regulatory steps um, drawing in many respects on models and best practices from Colorado and to a growing extent, New Mexico, and trying to move that into play. I heard um, the person who runs this program at EPA say just yesterday that they are hoping to have these rules and regulations in place by January of 2023, and now a little less than a year. That would be like moving at the speed of light in a regulatory context. Are there legal issues here? Are there potential court challenges? Might those same states that didn't like what President Obama did challenge this and slow this down? Absolutely. And I always worry about regulation, especially in the environmental space, made only through executive or largely through executive action, how durable that's going to be. Same issues apply at the state level. So that said, I think there really, really is some momentum. 
I would only add that there was active discussion and to pass the House to combine regulation with a fee, a tax in effect on methane. Pass the House of Representatives, the idea was to have a better system and then to use that financial incentive. That seems to be have, have fallen off the agenda because of issues in the Senate, but it, it did pass the House. And I, I would have felt much more confident in responding to your question if I could have said, yeah, the methane fee is in place and is gonna be a driver of change. So sort of a mixed reaction, but really great question. Um, so the next question comes from Caitlin Rausch, who's um, one of our honors students in the environmental studies program and in, in economics. And she asks, is there any country or state enacted legislation directed at addressing the agricultural emissions from the livestock emissions? And um, whether the answer is yes or no, are there, are there suggestions on pathways forward in this sector and these approaches? You know, Caitlin, um, I really appreciate that question. I have a wonderful um, graduate student, Trish Fisher, who will be releasing a paper alongside mine and her focus is on the ag methane side of it. Um, we and a couple of other graduate students have had like a, a methane working group. We call ourselves Team Methane for now two years and Trish keeps looking and looking and looking. And there are a few pockets in the US, a few pockets internationally, but it's really hard. And we can go pretty deep into the weeds here of you know, manure treatment, um, other kinds of things, but it's, it's slow. Can you change diets of cattle, all of these things? I think this, this is one where the science is moving pretty rapidly but the policy really seems to be low. And, tr and I'm, I'm happy if you wanna follow up with this to provide an e-introduction to Trish. I mean, her take on this is the politics when you really begin to look at livestock and agriculture nationally and globally is just even tougher than in the energy sector, especially if we're gonna be talking about major shifts. So I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't have a Colorado equivalent for you, I'm sorry. That's great. Well, I, I'll, I'll make that e-intro because Caitlin's going to do a write-up for the Wilson Center's new Security Beat blog on today's presentation. So it'd be great to get those links in there and, and that um, kind of uh, challenges. And certainly, you know, International Livestock Research Institute is doing that in the weeds, kind of figuring out how, what to what to feed livestock. So it's not um, so it reduces it, but um, lots of lots of behavior change possibilities there, to say the least. Um, Gilbert Michaud, who you know, is somebody who's worked with the University of Michigan uh, when his time here at Ohio University and now from uh, Loyola Chicago. Gilbert asks that, uh, you know, we've seen lots of cities, states, corporations uh, developing renewable energy and greenhouse reduction goals. Uh, do you see any similar movement for similar goals around methane and criteria air pollutants uh, in the US or elsewhere? Um, you know, kind of this classic challenge as you put forward, overwhelmingly the attention has been on carbon um, and wondering about whether we have kind of comparable developments on methane. Wonderful question and really, really good to, 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 to hear from you, um, Gilbert. Um, remember your time in Ann Arbor very well. Um, my understanding here and my colleague, Michigan colleague, Sarah Hughes has been working on this, that the overwhelming focus of cities and localities has been on carbon. Uh, we're, it's slow. Um, I do think what we are beginning to see though in some oil and gas producing states is more pushback that's coming from local communities that either want to stop oil and gas production or want some kind of controls and phasing it out in California. Uh, remarkably to me, and California is still the sixth or seventh largest producer of oil in the United States. Um, much of the focus is on Kern County, which is a little more rural. The second largest production county in California is Los Angeles County. There's been tremendous pushback in LA, environmental justice groups, community activists and the like to really constrain and probably move to try to prohibit drilling and we're certainly beginning to see in places like Colorado, where part of their reforms has been to allow local communities to become much more active. There, there's the, Colorado has peeled back this preemption that just ties the hands of local community groups. We're beginning to see that used very, very aggressively now in a number of counties and parts of, uh, of Colorado. So it's, it's starting, 
but it's been slower. And I also think that the bottom up opportunities here in the agricultural and livestock side are are just huge because so many issues related to farming uh, have a, a local or a kind of a county context to them rather than something that's done statewide. But it's not a deep it's not a deep set of policy initiatives that we're seeing so far. Okay. Also a great question. Well, we've come to end of the time. I'll uh, say thank you on, on behalf of the Voinovich School and I'll turn it back over to Mackenzie for any final words to bring us to a close. But Barry, thank you so much for sharing this new work and giving us a preview of what's coming in the literature and not yet there. So, and uh, probably a good thing you haven't published it already because you'd be racing to, to, to amend it and, and do a follow-up uh, uh, given what you've told us today. So Mackenzie, a final word? Thank you, Jeff. And I want to echo um, those thanks, Barry. I really appreciate you taking the time today to give this really insightful presentation on the politics of climate pollutants. Um, before we go, I do want to remind you all we have another session coming up next month. Um, on March 25th, we will be joined by Francis Akanabu, um, but he is a research associate um, for the Center of Health Outcomes Evaluation Studies at OSU. Um, so we'll be hearing from him next month, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Terrific. Thanks so much, Barry. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks Thank to all you. of you. Appreciate it. Yeah.